Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson go on a camping trip and they spend the entire day talking about reason and deduction and it gets late and they both go to sleep. And in the middle of the night, Sherlock wakes Watson up and he says, Watson, I want you to look up at the sky and tell me what you see. Watson says, I see millions of stars. Sherlock says, aha, so what does that tell you? Watson ponders for a moment and says, well, astrologically speaking, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and probably then billions of planets. Astrologically, it tells me that Saturn is in Leo. Time-wise, it tells me that it's probably a quarter past three in the morning. Theologically, it tells me the Lord is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, it looks like we will have a pleasant day tomorrow. What does it tell you, Sherlock? Sherlock thinks for a moment and says, well, Watson, what it tells me is that while we were sleeping, someone stole our tent. For thousands of years, it seemed self-evident to the vast majority of humanity that the universe was created by God. Even the most primitive of societies believed in some sort of creation story. Now, of course, certainly there are always people who are skeptical. There's no question about that. It wasn't until maybe 150 years ago, Charles Darwin, the son of a preacher, took it upon himself to come up with an alternative, a hypothesis to the beginning of time. Now, of course, there were skeptics for that as well. But over time, Darwinism became the most popular academic view. So, while we were sleeping, someone stole our tent. True, evolutionists and Christians still look up at the same stars, but we each see a different sky. Astronomically, astrologically, meteorologically, theologically, we are worlds apart, right? Worlds apart when it comes to what we believe. This morning, I wanna help you get your tent back. And to do that, we need to be like Sherlock Holmes. We need to look at evidence and clues and use reason and deduction. And I know, I know, you've been told there's no way to prove it. You've been told that the emperor wears no clothes, but that's not true. Lately, with the popularity of the James Webb Telescope, I think we've all been looking up again. And there's even talk in a few years about putting a working colony on the moon. So. Let's talk about the book of Genesis, and let's talk about the stars. We begin in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, I'm sure you know the Bible is not written in English. It's written in Hebrew in this part right here. And the word for God in Hebrew is Elohim. Right? So it says, in the beginning, Elohim created. Now that word created is the word bara. Just sounds so fun to say, right? Elohim bara. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and morning the very first day. So, right away, just within these first five verses, we see a God who speaks some sort of word and he makes things. Verse one says God is a creator. Verse two says God is a spirit. Verse three says God is a word. So he is one, but he also seems to be three, right? This God is a community. He's a community of creativity. Verse 6 says, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was an evening, and there was morning, and the second day. God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let dry land appear, and it was so. 
God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation and plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation and plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God sent them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the heavens across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea, creatures, and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps in the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Genesis chapter one is a poem. It's one poem. It's metered, probably uh, has a writer that intended it to be sung or maybe chanted. It it doesn't rhyme, rhyme's not important in Hebrew poetry, but Hebrew poems commonly use repetition, chiasms, parallelisms, and other symbolic schemes and expressions. So Genesis 1 is more than a story. It's also a poem. And like a poem, it's filled with all of these fascinating things. For instance, birds go in the sky and fish go in the water. Right? Of course. The sun, moon, and stars, they go into the heavens. Animals and human beings, they go in the land. That's the structure of the poem. In other words, the things that are made in day four, they get placed into day one. The things in day five correspond to day two. The things in day six fill in day three. And then the other thing you notice is, is that the first three days The text says God separates, God separates, God separates. And then the next three days, he fills, he fills, he fills. And we could go even deeper than that. You look at the words of the poem. The word creates appears in all three sections. And then in the last section, it occurs three times. And if you remember, within the first three verses, we learn that God has three distinct attributes. He is creator, he is spirit, he is word. And so there is this reoccurring number three that takes place throughout the poem. So are there other numbers? Yes. The phrase, it was so, occurs seven times. The phrase, and God saw, occurs seven times, which makes you wonder if there are more accounts of the number seven. Sure, the very first verse has seven words in Hebrew. The second verse has 14 words in Hebrew. 14 is seven times two. The word earth appears 21 times, which is seven times three. The seventh paragraph has 35 words, which is seven times five. And the word God also appears 35 times. So there are patterns of sevens that occur all throughout the poem. And if there's patterns of sevens and patterns of threes, 
it makes you wonder, well, are there patterns of tens? The phrase to make occurs 10 times. According to its kind occurs 10 times. And God said occurs 10 times. Three times in relation to people. Seven times in relation to creatures. Let there be occurs 10 times. Three times in relation to heaven. Seven times in relation to things on earth. So what is Genesis 1 about? Well, if you just had that text and nothing else, I would say, well, it's a story, and the story begins with God, and he creates. He creates the earth, and he creates people, and apparently that makes him happy, and then at the end of the story, he rests. And if Genesis 1 was all we had, we see there is a beginning, and somewhere in the middle there's us. There's our lives, and there's somehow we're tied to creation, tied to the earth, and tied to the heavens, and tied to the story. And then at the end, there is rest. So what do we do in this middle part? How are we involved in the story? What's our purpose? Well, again, if we just had this chapter, what does the Bible say about us? Verse 26 says, God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Well, what is God's likeness? What do we know about him so far? We know he's not just physical. He's also spiritual. We know he is a creator, and creating brings him joy, and he takes naps. God is an inventor, he's a problem solver, he's a thinker, he's a designer. Now, is that true of us? Absolutely. When you think about the wheel, the microprocessor, the printing press, the automobile, skyscrapers, right? Everything you see, every new invention, every new idea, and now the internet and the sharing of ideas, the James Webb telescope. Is there anything we can't do? Anything we can't create? I mean, we are uh, a pretty smart bunch. How did we get so smart? Well, some might say you take after your dad. Charles Darwin said, A scientific man ought to have no wishes, no affections, a mere heart of stone. Darwin said it's all random. You are random. You're accidental. How depressing. But if we look through the James Webb telescope, what could we decipher for ourselves? What other clues could we find about the origins of life? I mean, let's begin just with our own solar system. We have nine planets, right, circling the sun. Our Earth takes 365 days to circle the sun, and our moon takes 30 days to circle the Earth. Always, on schedule, without fail. That doesn't seem random. It doesn't seem accidental. There certainly seems to be, even there, some appearance of organization and design in our solar system because our solar system, especially our planet, has one very strange purpose. Our Earth, it seems its purpose is to be habitable for you. That's big. That's that's looking through the macro lens, right? Astronomers would have us believe that our universe has about 100 billion galaxies, and each galaxy, another 100 billion stars, and each within that, another 100 billion black holes. So stars, planets, galaxies, that's macro, that's big, it's, it's crazy. For instance, just, let's just look at one galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. The Andromeda galaxy is moving at 200,000 miles an hour and it's heading straight for us. It's true. It's going so fast that it gets five million 
miles closer every day. Five million miles closer every day. And it's going to be right on top of us in like a few billion years. You ever heard of a neutron star? They're a hyperdense star, meaning that they have a gravitational pull that pulls them inward. And when that happens, that changes everything we know about weight and mass. For instance, a neutron star that weighs 100 million tons could fit in your pocket. That's macro, that's big. But we can go micro. We can go small. Instead of looking through a telescope, we can look through a microscope. Look at DNA. Did you know that your DNA determines everything from your eye color, the shape of your head, your chin, your neck, your lips, your ears, your teeth, your skin color, your hair color, your height, even the shape of your nose? Your DNA is made up of 23 chromosomes from your mother and 23 chromosomes from your father. And that DNA molecule contains a vast amount of information that we call codon. Codon is a sequence of three nucleotides which form together to form genetic code. And that code in the human cell is three billion letters long. Every time a cell divides, that DNA reproduces itself to near perfect accuracy. Meaning, your human DNA contains all the information to build and rebuild your body. Now, from a design viewpoint, DNA is incredibly functional and exists in every living cell, from a single-celled organism to a human. And it's estimated that the DNA, the size of a pinhead, could contain as much information as 25 trillion books. Think of that. Everything in your body is controlled by three billion genes. The amount of information stored in a single nucleus is equal to a thousand encyclopedias, each with a thousand pages. Multiply that times our body's 10 trillion cells. A particle smaller than a speck of dust has enough knowledge to multiply into your complex body. And it knows the color, size, shape of everything. It knows how to hardwire you. It knows how to put together all your plumbing, every detail inside of you. And it's designed to be you and nobody else. Charles Darwin says there is no fundamental difference between a man and animals in their ability to feel pleasure, pain, happiness, and misery. Darwin said you evolved from a single-celled organism that all of your chromosomes were placed in the right order at the right time in the right place all by accident or, or luck. And when they came together, they were fully capable of coordinating with all the other genes. And when I look at creation, when I look at design, whether it's big like the universe or small like DNA, I am still amazed. I'm still filled with wonder. I'm not used to it. I am filled with awe. And Darwin says, eh, it's just dumb luck. I mean, let's just go out back into space. Okay, go back into space. Did you know that they found a planet that is racing through our galaxy at 67,000 miles per hour? And at the same time, it's also spinning at 1,000 miles per hour. And we call this planet Earth, <laughs> which is why you get dizzy sometimes. Now, the Earth is unique from many other planets, because you've probably seen a globe, right? You've seen a globe, and where, where's the axis on a globe? Does it go right to the center? No, it shifts off to one side, right? The Earth tilts by 23.5 degrees. Most other planets in the solar system are straight up. The Earth slants, right? It has a little bit of a, a, little bit of a swagger to it, a little bit of a lean to it. Why does the Earth tilt? Well, because if the Earth didn't tilt, it would run the risk of being tidally locked, which means that one side of the Earth would get stuck facing the sun all the time, and the other side would never see the light of day. So one side would get hotter and hotter until it could no longer sustain life, 
The other side would get colder and colder until it could no longer sustain life. So this 23.5 tilt on the Earth's axis is just enough, just precise enough to allow this little blue and green planet to sustain life. Which raises the question, how did it get like that? How did the Earth get its tilt? It tilts because it receives 40% of its gravitational pull from the sun. The sun pulls it over. But the other 60% comes from the gravitational pull from the moon. The moon and its pull is also what allows us to sustain life. In other words, if we didn't have a moon, there would be no life on this earth. So where did the moon come from? Well, scientists believe our moon was some sort of meteor or asteroid, and it was just floating by our galaxy and decided it would get stuck in our orbit. 23.5% tilt needed for life on planet Earth. The moon needed for life on planet Earth. Almost as if it was planned or a Adjusted, or you could even say it was fine-tuned for life. Now, when we read the Genesis poem, we noticed that when we dug in beneath the surface, we could see all of these patterns emerge, right? Well, what if we dug beneath the surface of science? Could we see patterns? Could we see this fine-tuning maybe even closer? Sure. So just imagine that the universe is made up of all of these dials, these, these things that you could turn back and forth, like, like adjustments on a radio. These dials turned to astonishingly precise levels. Charles Darwin says, I am turned into some sort of machine for observing facts and grinding out conclusions. That's great. What are those facts? The facts are sustaining life on this planet is a lot more difficult than you and I know. Any value that permits life to happen has a very exceedingly narrow range. And if any one of those dials are off by either this way or this way, just a fraction, it's end of life as we know it. No life of any kind could exist anywhere. For instance, the Earth receives 99% of its energy from the sun. The sun converts for us 4 million tons of energy every second. And over an 11 year cycle, that output varies less than one tenth of a percent. So that's all taking place with the sun 93 million miles away from us. But if it was 92 million miles away from us, there would be no life on planet Earth. If it was 94 million miles away from us, there would be no life on planet Earth. Hydrogen on planet Earth must continually convert 0.007 of its mass to helium to sustain human life. If it was 0.008, no life on planet Earth. 0.006, no life on planet Earth. And our planet is just the right size to possess oxygen-rich atmosphere. If, it were, if our planet was larger or smaller, it would not be able to maintain atmosphere because it would have either a too large uh, gravitational pull or too small, which means only the size of planet Earth would work. I could keep going. Let's keep going. Our oceans are 3.4% salt which is the same amount of salt that is in your bloodstream, okay? If there were 4% salt in our ocean or in our body, no life on planet Earth. If there were 2% salt in the ocean or in your body, no life on planet Earth. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these unbelievably precise numbers that all add up to life on planet Earth. And it's, it isn't just that there are hundreds and hundreds of them and somehow 
someone has adjusted them just perfectly, it's also this haunting truth that if just one of them were slightly turned in another direction, then every single other system on this planet would fail. Nobel Prize winning physicist Paul A.M. Dirac, he made a very early crucial contribution to both quantum mechanics and quantum electrodynamics. He said, God is a mathematician of a very high order, and he used advanced mathematics in constructing the universe. Life is so complex, and every part of life comes together simultaneously, working together, perfectly figured, or you don't have life. Let's say you were walking down the street, and you saw the beach over there, and you said, I'm gonna go take a stroll on the beach. Just, a not, it's a nice day, take my shoes off, right? And you go strolling down the beach, and in the sand you find my digital watch. And it's just laying there in the sand, and you think to yourself, wow, that's incredible. To think that over thousands and thousands of years, the sand and this water has come together and formed this watch. Is that what you would think? Is that what you would come to? That would be your conclusion? Or would you think to yourself, this was designed? No, no, no. This was created by intelligence. This is fine-tuned. This is handcrafted. Right? Is, is the watch accidental? Is it happenstance? Is it, is it just this, just because? Or... Or, or, or is this intentional? Does this have purpose? I mean, let's, let's go back to Genesis. Has Genesis always been the creation story? Well, of course not. Uh, lots of people groups had their own creation story. But most of those other creation stories, much like Darwin's story, were about accidents. They were about conflicts or war. You know, two gods were fighting and they accidentally made the earth. Or two gods fell in love and they accidentally made the earth. It was, it was an accident. It was coincidence that this, all of this, was made by accident. Just, much like American folklore. You know, we have the stories of Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox. Paul used Babe the Blue Ox to pull a heavy tank wagon which was used to coat the newly straightened lumber roads with ice in the winter until one day that tank sprung a leak and that leak trickled south and that leak became the Mississippi River. In other words, it wasn't planned. It was an accident. It wasn't intentional. It was a fortunate mistake. But then, flowing against that, flowing against those voices that say the world and you and I are accidents, there was a Middle Eastern story that talked about the beginnings of dirt and clay and water and animals and people. But instead of conflict being the source, instead of randomness being the birth, instead we were created by a loving, community-existing, intelligent artist. A God that loved to make things. And when he makes things, he steps back and says, that, that, that's good. That's beautiful. And then he makes you. And then he says, now it's your turn. You go and make things. You read Genesis 1, God's not angry. God's not fighting. God's not clumsy. No, like an artist or a sculptor or a programmer, he thinks and he creates and it brings him joy to do it. Every other system, including Darwinism, says there is no joy in creation. The earth was an illegitimate child. The universe, an accident, a coincidence. It was happenstance. It came about by a violent explosion, right? It came about because two gods were at war. And the Hebrews said, no, 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 no. This is all because of love. We are the result of joy. 
And we were intended. We were wanted. You know, with everything that's going on in the world right now, whether it's conflict in a denomination or conflict between countries or conflict between political parties, I believe that what you look for, you will find. If you're paranoid, you're going to find things in this world to be paranoid about. If you're worried, you are going to find things in this world to be worried about. If you're skeptical, you will find things in this world to be skeptical about. If you're a pessimist, you're going to find things in this world to be pessimistic about. Psalm chapter 14, verse 1 says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Notice where skepticism and pessimism comes from. Where it really is. It's not in the head. It's not in the mind. It's not in logic. It's not in reason. It's not based on evidence. It's a heart posture, right? What you look for in the universe, you will find. Because when you look at the universe, when you look at the world or the moon or your own DNA, you see there's a lot more going on just beneath the surface. And when you read the Bible and you're willing to look deeper than the printed words on the page, you see there's a lot more going on beneath the surface. And I know, I know, we talked a lot about planets and DNA and stars today, and maybe you feel like, I didn't get enough Bible. And, and you know, when you come to church, you want to learn more about God and not science. But I guess that's the point. Science and God are not opposites. Joseph Taylor Jr., who received the 1993 Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of the first known binary pulsar, said a scientific discovery is also a religious discovery. There is no conflict between science and religion. Our knowledge of God is made larger with each discovery we make about the world. And Albert Einstein said it even better. Science without religion is lame. <laughs> And religion without science is blind. You see, the world wants you to pick a side. In everything, right? Vote and pick a side. Stand over here with us. No, 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 no. Stand over here with us. But I hope you are starting to see that the more you take sides, the more you choose sides, separates us from one another. But I think we can learn that if we come together, we can see that science and God are not enemies. Science does not disprove God. I think the opposite is true. I think the Bible agrees. Romans 1 says, For his invisible attributes, namely his internal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In, in, in what? In the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. In other words, the secret is right there. The proof is right there. In the waterfall, in the Grand Canyon, in the depths of the ocean, in the Milky Way, our God is seen in the bigness and the smallness. One more quote, and I'll let you go. This is from Werner von Braun. He is the father of space science, and he's the most important rocket science ever involved in the development of the US space program. He was director of the Marshall Space Flight Center, and he's the chief architect of the Saturn V. The vast mysteries of the universe should only confirm our belief in the certainty of its creator. I find it as difficult to understand a scientist who does not acknowledge the presence of a superior rationality behind the existence of the universe as it is to comprehend a theologian who would deny the advances of science. The evolutionists challenge science to prove the existence of God. But must we really light a candle to see the sun? They say they cannot visualize a designer. Well, can a physicist visualize an electron? What strange rationale 
make some physicists accept the inconceivable electron as real, while refusing to accept the reality of a designer on the grounds that they cannot conceive him. Thus, I am certain that were Jesus among us today, Christ would encourage scientific research as modern man's most noble striving to comprehend and admire his Father's handiwork. The universe, as revealed through scientific inquiry, is the living witness that God has indeed been at work. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Friends, we are without excuse, no matter if we look through a telescope or through the microscope. What you look for, you will find. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your bigness, and we thank you for your smallness. We know that if we would just seek you with an open heart, that we would find you, because your Bible says that you stand at the heart of every door and knock, and that you are just waiting to be let in. So Lord, we pray for that. We pray that even the universe can be used for evangelism. Even the James Webb Telescope can be used for evangelism, that science does not disprove you, it proves you. May we not be afraid of science because you made science. Give us a hunger and a thirst to go deeper, to go beneath the surface, to find the answers so that one day every knee bows and every tongue confesses. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for hanging out with us. We're going to do a whole series on this. If you liked this, keep coming back each week. We're going to be talking about the universe, talking about creation, talking about nature, incorporating all of those things that we see all the time into how we think about God. But of course, we'd really love it if you were here, here. You can come here. You can come here. We have two services every Sunday. We have a traditional service at 930. It's with our choir, and they're going to sing all of your favorite hymns that you learned growing up. We also have communion. We read the Lord's Prayer. We have responsive readings. It's everything you remember about classic church. And then our 11 o'clock service is our contemporary service. We have a worship team, and we ask you, please, Come as you are, come as you feel comfortable. We also have a full children's program at that hour from nursery all the way through high school. And we have a youth group that meets for middle school students and high school students every Wednesday at 5.30. We'll even feed them. We'll feed them for you and send them home to you in about two hours. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.